All right. Okay. Well, let's go ahead. We'll start in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, everywhere present and filling all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all stain, and save our souls, O gracious one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome everyone to our Theology on Tap um, <laughs> online, um, and we have, are very blessed this evening to have um, Father David Anderson with us um, speaking on fasting and feasting in the church. Um, just a little introduction um, and welcome to Father David, um, a little introduction of him. He's a, a priest of the Ukrainian Catholic Eparchy of Chicago. Um, he served as a parish priest for over for 39 years. Um, he studied uh, liturgical theology with Alexander Schmemann. Um, he's also been um, a translator of patristic texts and Byzantine liturgical texts. Um, he's taught in a, in a various number of platforms, um, and most recently he's the Byzantine Rite Chaplain and, and also a professor at Wyoming Catholic College um, in Lander, Wyoming. And we're just so blessed to have you here with us this evening. We're so excited to hear um, a little bit of your wisdom. Thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Um, and so I'll turn the floor over to you, Father David. Thanks, Mother Gabriella, and uh, thanks for your welcome and Greetings to everybody who is who is here hearing this broadcast from uh, in cars, in rooms, wherever wherever you may be, um, our, and and greetings especially from from Lander, Wyoming, and Wyoming Catholic College, which has the I guess I'll call it a distinction has the distinction of being the only uh, Catholic college in the in North America. That well, I have. I better be careful. Uh, in, in the United States, I don't know about Canada, but in the United States, the only Catholic college to have a uh, resident uh, Byzantine Catholic chaplain and a Byzantine chapel, since you got to have a chapel to have a chaplain, and a full cycle of of uh, our services and uh, full liturgical life and, and very active. Uh, we had yesterday on the feast of Saint Nicholas. Well, over 100 people uh, in, in church for the liturgy. So there's lots of opportunities here for people who maybe never have had an encounter with the Eastern churches to have one here. Anyway, uh, so if anybody out there is listening and looking for a good school to come to check us out. Um, now, our, our topic this evening is well, is it fasting and feasting, or is it feasting and fasting? And you might say, well, what's the difference? But uh, I think there is. I think there is. And I think that difference is the point where I'm going to start, because I'm going to uh, begin with feasting and not with fasting, simply because that's where the Lord begins in the gospel. Although he himself, it is true, uh, even before he calls the apostles and begins his ministry, of course, does fast for 40 days, and that's become the model for Christian fasting. Nevertheless, uh, in the church, before there came to be a pattern and a rule for Christian fasting, there was feasting first. And so I refer you to the passage, for example, in the uh, beginning of Mark's gospel, also found, I think it's found in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where uh, the disciples of the Pharisees say to Jesus one day, why do we and the disciples of John the Baptist fast, but your disciples don't? And Jesus answers in a way that, unless we understand the context, might sound a little unusual to us. He says, can the guests of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is still with them? But the days are coming when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Now, that passage has been understood by the fathers of the church when they comment on it 
to mean that the essential relationship in the life of the church is between Christ the bridegroom and his bride the church that his bride that he the bridegroom and the church his bride are together that that togetherness of the incarnate son of god sacrificed for the life of the world triumphant over death and his people is first and therefore first or another somewhat redundant way of saying it primarily expressed by the feast by the banquet by the expression of fulfillment and without going we don't have time to go into great detail with a lot of things so i want to make sure that i get a few points in in this talk but what that how that worked itself out in time, and I think probably many of you know this, but if you don't, uh, and even if you do, to be reminded of again. Uh, in the liturgy of the church, the church celebrated the Paschal season, the resurrection of, of the Lord and the, his ascension and the, and the descent of the Holy Spirit, the joy of the victory of the Messiah over death and sin, and the coming of the kingdom of God by his resurrection and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. On the level of the liturgical seasons, the church celebrated that first chronologically. And it took the church 300 years to come up with the idea of having a season to prepare for that with fasting. So that's why feasting first, then fasting. So we feast in order to fast and fast in order to feast. And that's not just uh, a kind of oh, uh, nice detail because it expresses something that's very central uh, to the life of the church. And that is that the church is the presence in the world and in time of the joy of the kingdom of God. And if people, and I, I was just uh, speaking with my uh, theology class of juniors here at WCC today on, the, on Pope Emeritus Benedict's encyclical Space Salvi, you know, the hope of our salvation. And uh, Pope Benedict, who is, is very measured and precise in his style of writing, has said a few prophetic things. And usually we, when we hear, oh, someone's speaking prophetically, we think it's going to be something uh, extreme or shocking. But uh, Pope Benedict writes that he foresees, he said this some decades ago now, he foresees the church becoming smaller and smaller, numerically, not bigger and bigger. And he even says that the church will have to uh, abandon many of the large institutions and even many of the great buildings that it has. That the church will not be able to maintain these things anymore. Will not have the means or the influence to do such things anymore. And the church will become a smaller, much smaller, but more intense communion of the faithful where people in this world that is be becoming more and more completely given over to secularism and therefore, as I would say, becoming more and more gray with neither fasting nor feasting, but just gray imploding boredom and the absence of love that some people in that oppression that is more and more surrounding us will seek the joy of the church and the church needs to be there with the joy of the feast of the bridegroom and the bride because that is what people are starving for the joy of the resurrection the grace of god is poured out into our hearts by the joy of the holy spirit that is given to us as saint paul says i paraphrase that a little bit so that joy comes first and 
Therefore, it doesn't work to say, well, if I repent enough, and if I fast enough, and if I struggle enough, if I endure enough, maybe at some point I'll reach some sort of joy. Whatever measure of truth there is in those words, they are not adequate because actually I have to begin with the joy of the Lord. And if I begin with the joy of the Lord, the desire to, to grow in the intensity of the joy of the Lord, then the necessity for effort, for the ascetic life, for fasting, in order that there may be the energy for the feast. See, we, oh, we fast in order to feast. What does that mean? That, that and anybody who has really entered into the celebration as the church provides for us, you know that it takes more energy to feast than to fast. We think it's the other way around, but it's not. We, we fast in order to focus our energy in anticipation for the feast. That's what people have got to understand about fasting. Fasting has gotten a bad press from people presenting it as some sort of, of, in some sort of atmosphere of sadness in which we punish ourselves. That is not why we fast. We fast in order to have a greater capacity for the festal joy of the union of the divine bridegroom with his bride. And at just as we do, we receive that pattern from the apostles because the apostles did not witness, except for St. John, did not witness the sufferings and death of Jesus. They ran from it in fear and hid from it. It was the risen Lord Jesus that had to come to them and give them the, he breathed on them, as, as the Gospel of John tells us, breathed new life into them because they were shot. He breathed new life in them, said, receive the Holy Spirit. Then, having received into themselves the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the joy of the Lord and the union of the bridegroom and the bride, then they were able to go out and, sa and sacrifice. So you see that for the Lord Jesus, his self-sacrifice for the life of the world, his suffering comes first chronologically, followed by his resurrection. But in the case of the apostles, they have to partake of the resurrection first before they're able to go out and bear witness and offer themselves in sacrifice for the Lord. And so it is for us. We have to begin with joy and the struggle, not only to live in that joy, but to live more deeply and deeply in it. I always like to give illustrations from liturgical history because they uh, uh, very well express and portray what we're speaking of here. You know, in the great church of the resurrection of our Lord in Jerusalem that contains the tomb and Golgotha, now it's called Church of the Holy Sepulcher, but in the, in the ancient church, it's called the Church of the Resurrection. The liturgical processions always started at the tomb and went to the cross. We might say, well, why not the other way around? Because that's the way it happened chronologically. Why not start at the cross and go to the tomb? They don't do that. And that also manifests the reality that everything is founded in the resurrection. So uh, we feast that we might learn the necessity of fasting, and we fast so that we may have the capacity for feasting. So another way of expressing this that I, maybe some of you have heard this in some of my other talks, I don't know. But uh, St. Augustine had uh, a, a way in Latin of expressing two dimensions in the life of the church. He said that the church lives simultaneously in statu vie and in statu patrie. That means on the road and at home. On the road is 
the pilgrimage to the kingdom of God. It's the effort, the struggle, everything that we mean in the word repentance. But at home is, of course, the fulfillment, the partaking in the feasting of the age to come. In St. John of Damascus's Paschal Canon, that in the Byzantine tradition we sing on Pascha morning, and in the it actually in the text of the Divine Liturgy, sometimes you don't hear the priest say this, but the priest is supposed to say after communion, after people ever everyone's received communion, and he's preparing to bless the people with the chalice, uh, and and the priest says, "Oh Christ, great and most holy Pascha." Wisdom, word, and power of God, grant that we may more perfectly partake of you in the never-ending day of your kingdom, which shall have no evening. That's the last verse of St. John of Damascus's Paschal Canon. So we're always asking for more, for a greater capacity. That's why we repent so that we can be healed from our stubborn self-centeredness. And gain a capacity for the joy of the kingdom of God. So fasting, therefore, is first and foremost an, an act of anticipation. It is an act of waiting, waiting, waiting for the kingdom of God. We have the authority of the gospel that our Lord practiced it in that intense period before uh, following his baptism and before the call of the apostles. In the, in the midst of that fast of Jesus our Lord, he encountered the enemy, the evil one. And just as the evil one tried to tempt our first parents by eating something that God told them not to eat, so the enemy with Jesus tries in his, in his indescribable arrogance to divide the Father from the Son. If you are the Son of God, do this, command the stones to be bred, jump down from the temple and, and make yourself look like Superman. Uh, I, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth because, because their power is, is mine to give, says the devil. By the way, the devil is the father and the father of lies. So we don't know that, we don't know that he's telling the truth there, that he has all the power over the kingdoms of the earth, by the way. He says he does, but he lies a lot. So all you have to do, he says, is fall down and worship me. In all those things, the devil, Satan, says to Jesus, uh, be, be your own person. Be independent just like Adam and Eve declared themselves independent of God. If you are the son of God, show that, show that you have that independence and, and Jesus will have none of that. Jesus who says that he's come only to do the will of the Father. And therefore, he heals by his victory in, in the fast and his encounter with the devil what the transgression begins the healing of the transgression of, of Adam and Eve in, in paradise who, who sin by eating that mysterious fruit that stands for trying to be God without God. So Jesus fasts, his disciples fast. He says to them, by the way, in the Sermon of the Mount, on the Mount, and therefore says to us, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. He does not say if you fast. He says when you do it. If and when are two very different words. If is, it says maybe you will, maybe you won't. When says you will do it. And when you do it, this is how you do it. You don't fast like the hypocrites with a gloomy face. But you fast so that your father in heaven may see what you do. We are told by <clears throat> the Lord Jesus that there are manifestations of the evil spirits in people that cannot be driven out except by prayer and fasting. We read that gospel a couple times a year in, in the divine liturgy, once from Matthew, once from Luke, once from Mark, three times a year actually. 
the apostles are described in the Acts of the Apostles frequently as fasting. So there's nothing abnormal about it. It's, a, it's part of the life of the church. This act of breaking the routine in various ways, of eating what we want, when we want, and how we want, because in that sense, especially uh, now, everyone is called to fast, whether they, whether they ordinarily have plenty of food available to them or don't. But it's certainly true that in our situation, most of us have a great deal of what we would like to eat when we would like to have it. And so it's very easy to allow ourselves to be sated most of the time. And so when we fast, we break that routine as an act of anticipation to enter into the reality of something bigger, something bigger than ourselves, something bigger than the here and now, something bigger than that construct that we call my life. And we do it by taking one of the principal drives that we have, the drive for food, and limiting it. It is not some sort of masochistic act. It's not a means by which we punish ourselves for our sins. It's rather an expression of emptying oneself out as a physical expression because we are, our body is the form of our soul, as the fathers say. So we're a soul-body unity. St. John of Damascus says, you, O Lord, have created me from a nature both visible and invisible, a compound nature. We don't have two natures. Our, our Lord Jesus does, divine and human, in his incarnation. But we have one nature, but that nature is compound. There is a visible and invisible dimension of it, a material and spiritual dimension of it. And therefore, everything that we do as persons reflects that compound nature. That is, if we're healthy. If we try to stamp out either the spiritual or the material in ourselves, we end up uh, unbalanced and therefore not, not fully human as God created us to be. So there's got to be this physical expression of emptying oneself out in order to wait for the Lord and to enter in more fully into the feast. Just consider the season that we are in now, the, the season of preparation for the Lord's birth and how uh, in our society, and I, I mean, I don't begrudge uh, you know, the people who are not church people, I don't begrudge them their happiness at this time of the year if it's genuine happiness. But unfortunately, it's unfocused in most cases. And it winds up with the feast uh, having ended before Christmas has even come. <laughs> at latest on Christmas Day, if not on Christmas Eve, it's already over. So where, and of course, with none of the, liturgical content that this celebration is meant to have. There's a beautiful hymn that's sung on Christmas morning in the, in the service of Matins, uh, where we say that we, we are paying uh, our taxes to the Lord, just as the Magi brought their gifts. So we pay our taxes not with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but with the praises of loving hearts in the true faith. And without that focus, of course, th this feast that, that still bears the name of Christ uh, in our society, even though there are, there are forces that would like to eliminate that as well, this feast of Christ's mass becomes hollow and empty. And therefore, it's impossible to sustain it for very long. But we are, of course, after the season of preparation, supposed to celebrate it with intensity for 12 days. And, and even beyond that, it extends all the way for the 40 days until February 2nd. But those in, in the Christian culture as it existed, both in, both in the Greek East and the Latin West, the 
12 days, by the way, the 12 days of Christmas originally come from the Greek tradition. They're called the Dodecameron, the, the 12 days. And they were intended to be given over to continual rejoicing. Uh, that's what I mean by, by saying that to actually do that, to celebrate, is it takes energy. It takes energy and it takes real joy if it's going to be authentic. And the, the reason why there's much, much, much less of that, even in the church right now, is that uh, we have allowed these rhythms of, of fasting and feasting, feasting and fasting, to, re, to be replaced by the gray routine too much of the time. And we are terrified, even terrified of breaking out of it, many people are. They don't, they don't know what to do with themselves. And we have to learn again what to do with ourselves uh, together, because this is this is a communal affair in the church. As we grow into the bride of Christ, his his the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, in union with him and the Father and the Holy Spirit. So fasting, therefore, has is sanctified by the the uh, example of the Lord himself, of the apostles, of all the saints throughout the ages. Our particular period of time in the history of the church is abnormal in that fasting is heavily ignored, not only, not, not only in, in uh, outside of our Eastern Catholic churches, but it, we have to be honest and say it's, it's ignored within our churches as well, too. Our churches have, for the most part, uh, followed the example of uh, other, other Christians. And again, I'm, it's not my purpose to, to you know, comment upon the, the state of Christians outside the communion of the church or, or the state of, of things now in the in the Western tradition of the church, but certainly the movement has been to a minimalizing uh, of these rhythms so that they are reduced almost, if not eliminated altogether, they are reduced to a, a very, very limited, minimal, uh, symbolic in the worst sense of that word, because symbols are good things, but uh, sometimes a symbol that really doesn't have any, any uh, content to it anymore. So we, following the example, by the way, uh, another, another uh, warning for us all to have, sometimes uh, it's the uh, tendency of, of Christians now within the church to think that uh, the cycles of prayer and fasting are meant for the professionals. Uh, namely the monks and nuns, let them do it. Let them do it. We can't be expected to do that. Well, I, I have to, uh, it, in any talk about this, it's, it's my duty to remind us all that although the cycles of prayer and fasting as they developed in the church, certainly the uh, monastic influence was, was very much a factor, yet nevertheless, these cycles were developed before monasticism itself developed for the most part. Mm -hmm. So they come from the experience of the church. In fact, most of the um, content of the fasting rule that we have was developed by the laity, as we would say, mm -hmm. in, in the first centuries of the church, first three, four centuries. And then it, it acquired a more, a more developed form, yes, but it was there from the start. Whereas, whereas people living together or living as hermits in the monastic life, you know, the first mention that we have of it is in the, in the third century, and then in the fourth century, it really got a lot of momentum. Mm -hmm. But uh, fasting in the church, even from the first century in the sub-apostolic age, we're told in the Didache that the... Christians fasted on Wednesday and Friday. They chose those days specifically in order to be conformed to 
union with Christ in his passion. The Lord, the, the agreement by Judas to betray Jesus was sealed on Wednesday. And then, of course, the passion itself occurs on Friday. So the Christians begin in, in the first century to fast on Wednesday and Friday. This fast would have been a total fast that went until the ninth hour. We have other written testimonies of this. So three till three o'clock in the afternoon, the, or the traditional you know, ninth hour. And again, why that time is chosen, it's chosen because that's the hour of Jesus' death. So everything is con being conformed to having a share in Christ's passion. Uh, in addition to that, there is fasting before the Paschal celebration from from a few days to a week. And then as time goes on, then Lent is added to that and then the fasting seasons. In addition to that, there is the uh, practice that is again testified from the from what we call the sub-apostolic age, you know, the age after the, the apostles have died. You find any number of references to uh, fasting before receiving the Holy Eucharist. And always in the context that the body and blood of Christ being the food of eternal life is not to be preceded on the day that it is, it is received by the food of this world, that the Eucharist comes first. And yes, of course, it's not just the modern times, but it's ancient times too, that knew that there were going to be some exceptions to that, that knew that some people could not fast as strictly as others. That was always taken into account, but nevertheless, the basic rhythm was there, that you anticipate and prepare for the coming of the Lord by putting yourself on watch, on vigilance. And vigilance includes fasting. Um, our, and I, I, I see myself as, as why I'm not the only voice, but a, a voice that, that would like to, uh, whenever I have the opportunity, summon people in our church uh, back to the observance of the traditional Eucharistic fast, and not the not the shortened one that that uh, since 1950 was was an innovation in, in in the West because we have the testimony of 1900 years of church tradition and observance behind us, and we just can't shrug it off by saying, "Oh, people can't do that in modern times." We unfortunately reduce then the receiving of Eucharist to an act of convenience that can be done without any kind of preparatory period before it. And in the end, the results can be more harm than good. So uh, those, those specific observances of fasting, the Eucharistic fast, the weekly fasts, the seasonal fasts. I don't think this is the, the time to go into all the details of observing how, how those things have come to be observed. There's, there's some detail to it. So uh, I, would, I would see that the purpose of this talk is an invitation for all of us to uh, have an attitudinal change to the extent that it's necessary and what fasting is, what it's for. Uh, what it accomplishes in us, uh, it's, no, it, it's no guarantee of anything. It must be done. Uh, here's something that I wrote some years ago about it when I was preparing a summary to teach people about fasting. I'll actually read a little bit of this. Um, the practice of fasting in the Eastern Catholic and Orthodox tradition uh, is not seen primarily as a penance binding under church law. It is a self-imposed ascetical discipline intended to increase vigilance, detachment from this world as a weapon for opposing evil. Thus, we speak in the Eastern tradition of a rule of fasting that is embraced as a standard or measure, and we respect these rules as being tried and true by the example of generations of faithful believers, the efficacy of fasting is in direct proportion to our continual struggle to live a life 
which centers on corporate and personal prayer, growth in love for God and neighbor, and confrontation of our own sinful tendencies. That's what fasting is meant to help. It's a tool mm -hmm. on, on the path of repentance. If we, uh, if there's all sorts, those of you who come to the Lenten services in the Byzantine tradition know that they are full of all sorts of warnings about what happens to those who take pride in their fasting and compare themselves to others in their fasting. They become devilish, says the Lenten Triodion. They become, if you, there's a verse that says, in vain do you rejoice in not eating, O my soul. For if you fast from food and from your evil passions, you are, you are not purified. You are becoming more and more like the evil demons who never eat at all. So there is no virtue in itself in the mechanics of fasting. Its virtue is discovered when it is used together and within a lifestyle that is seeking and thirsting and hungering, as the Beatitude says, for God. And in that sense, it is desperately needed in our church. The, just as the rebirth of feasting is desperately needed in our church. Uh, if, we, if we don't do that, we're going to be more and more permeated by the, as I said, described it already, as the grayness that surrounds us. And what will we have to offer those who seek us out? What we can't, we can't simply offer to people a collection of ideas. Ideas don't save. It is the tangible presence of the joy of the Lord lived by those who believe in him that will attract so many who are, whose lives are, are empty of that joy and who seek it. Um, it's by the way that we use our time. Um, time, if it is simply seen, one, one of the great uh, uh, Jewish writers, the, the uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, says in his book, The Sabbath, if we treat time simply as a fuel to be burned, in order that I, I use my time, I burn up my time fuel so I can exert my control over my little piece of space. I use my time to control my space, to make this imaginary and delusional world in which I'm the center of, of things that I control and revolve around me. If that's what I do with my time, then I am more and more lost, not more and more found. I'm more and more imploding, not more and more exploding in the love of God. But rather, the church gives us the seasons of fasting and feasting so that through them we can have a door through time into eternity. Just as before uh, the divine liturgy begins, you know, the deacon, if one is fortunate to have a deacon to serve at the liturgy, says to the priest, it is time for the Lord to act, Father, give the blessing. Uh, and that is not the deacon saying to the priest, well, it's not only nine o'clock on Sunday morning, but it's maybe 9.08 by that time. And it's time to begin, Father. It's time for the Lord to act. It's time to go from the door through the door of the chronological time into the time of God's now, the time of God's eternity, so that we may rejoice at his table in his kingdom. And that's what the uh, cycles of feasting and fasting are a means to uh, attain. Uh, bishop Kalistos Ware in Oxford, the Orthodox bishop there, uh, begins his introduction to the Lenten Triodion, the, the Lenten service book, by saying, we waited and at last our expectations were fulfilled. We waited 
and our expectations were fulfilled. And that waiting, anticipating the coming of the Lord, which we share in already, before it happens chronologically at the end of the age, we share mystically now at the Lord's table in his kingdom. So uh, let us all uh, embrace with, with uh, greater and greater capacity this great treasure of the life of our church and not simply dismiss it as a bunch of uh, uh, archaic rules that don't have anything to do with modern life. But let's see it for what it is and uh, a mean of great enrichment in the life of the life of, the, of righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul says. So I think I'll stop. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Father. That was beautiful. Um, just all the, th oh, I mean, <laughs> I'm like furiously taking notes. I'm like, why did I only bring one sheet of paper? <laughs> um, but that, yeah, that was beautiful. What would you say, what would be, I know you said you didn't think of a, a, a question kind of beforehand, but as you kind of are reflecting on that, as you were sharing, what would, what would be a, a question you would pose to us to kind of work out? <laughs> Um, well, I guess I guess the overall question would be: Is is this really relevant to us? Do mm -hmm. we we accept it as such? Do we accept it as true? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Or or do we dismiss it as something as uh, uh, some sort of you know frosting on the cake, or some or some people are into it, but not everybody has to be. It's interesting. I was wondering, you were talking about the, the 12 days of Christmas. Um, was that meant to mirror like Bright Week or like? like uh, not only Bright Week, but of course, Bright Week is the, the most intense part of the entire season of, the, of the, not, not just 50, but 57 uh, days actually from, from Pascha to All Saints Sunday, mm -hmm. which because the our, our tradition comes from uh, especially uh, the document that's called the Didascalia Apostolorum, the teaching of the apostles. It's different from the Didache. It's a Syrian document of the, of the fourth century. So it's going into a lot of detail. Fourth century start getting a lot of detail. And mm -hmm. so we, we, celebrate, we celebrate for the 50 days plus one week more. That's, that's, that's where we, we get that. Mm -hmm. So the yes, the the Paschal, the you know the the services for the feasts of Christmas and Theophany, as anybody mm -hmm. who goes to them knows, they are modeled on the Holy Week services. Mm -hmm. uh, the several day pre feast before Christmas and Theophany, even uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict, you know, in his book Jesus of Nazareth, speaks of it uh, because he's he has this he's one of these great two lunged uh, guys who who uh, you know knows knows the the traditions uh, not only his own but others and he mentions how in the liturgical text before Christmas and before Theophany there are paraphrases of what we sing during Holy Week mm. because of course the Lord coming to be born of the virgin that's his act of self-emptying of taking flesh and dwelling among us and our lord going into the water being shown by john as the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world and so we sing christ comes up from the waters and carries the world up with him uh, carries it away into the desert and meets the devil with it mm -hmm. and even in the icons you know how there is in the uh, nativity of the Lord, there's, there's that black cave. Mm -hmm. and how frequently, if not all the time in the theophany, but sometimes even the water of theophany is seen, shown like a tomb almost. In the nativity, the Lord sh is shown like a, in the manger, the manger looks like a little grave and he looks like a little corpse. Mm -hmm. and, and then in the water also uh, surrounded by the waters, and then finally, of course, in his descent into death, the ultimate descent. So the, the, his birth and his baptism uh, foreshadow his ultimate descent in his, in his death and descent into Hades. So the liturgical services of Christmas and Theophany are modeled 
on the Paschal model. That's why we have um, Christmas of Theophany Eve royal hours like we have on Good Friday. That's why we have a vigil liturgy in addition to the liturgy on the day like we have for Holy Saturday and Pascha. Mm -hmm. So there's this deliberate imitation of the Paschal model. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And even some, at least in our, I'm assuming it's in all traditions, there's some of the, like the sessional hymns and things oftentimes will have the same like um, same, melody. same melodies <laughs> yeah. um which is beautiful too um it, yeah as soon as you as you were saying the thing about how feasting takes more takes more from us like we need to fast in order to prepare to feast because the the feasting is going to take even more <laughs> my first thought was like anyone knows that's true who's who celebrated all of theophany like <laughs> Like if you've done the great blessing of water and royal hours and twice, if you do it twice, even go inside <laughs> on inside on the eve and outside on, on the day. We, we yeah. The, the canyon. <laughs> and liturgy and matins. Yeah. It's yeah. it's yeah, you're ready to drop. I was just that was like immediately I just had that image of like, yeah, processing to the pond to <laughs> to bless the water. Like this is that that's that's absolutely true. Um Another question that came to mind, you were, I, I don't, you don't have to go into it in great detail. You were kind of mentioning the other fasting seasons. Um, do you know, like, in what order those kind of came about? Like, yeah. which came first? Yeah. Besides, obviously, the great fast. Mm -hmm. Of course, first comes, first comes the Paschal fast, as it's called, in the first couple hundred years. And that from, and there's a lot written about this. One of the best, if you're interested in reading more about this, is to get a hold of some of the books of Father Raniero Canto La Mesa, mm, you know, okay. a, a preacher to the paper house, papal household, but he's also a patristics and liturgical scholar. Okay. And that's what he was before he became the preacher to the papal household. So he has a book called Easter in the Early Church, Easter okay. in the Church, and it's a goldmine of texts and commentary, his, his commentary on the texts. And so you, so it begins with, with this Paschal fast. There isn't even Holy Week yet. Holy Week doesn't come as we know it till the fourth century. So then Holy Week and Lent develop. And in one more century, just one more century into the fifth century, the, the period before the Nativity, and also they don't call it the Apostles' Fast in the, in the early sources. They call it the Fast After Pentecost. Okay. But the fast that goes now from after the eight weeks of the Paschal Pentecostal season to Saints Peter and Paul that we do call now the Apostles' Fast has gotten that, that name. Then there's a little bit more complex of a history for, for what we now call the Dormition Fast. It's not mentioned in, in the early sources. But in fact, what is mentioned is, uh, this might give us a little bit of... Uh, uh, <laughs> may make us a little afraid. It seems, it seems that what we know now as the Dormition Fast was part of something longer that was, that was focused on the exaltation of the cross. Mm -hmm. Transfiguration to exaltation of the cross, which is another 40-day period. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and although, mm -hmm. although you, don't, you don't find the observance of a 40-day period like that anymore, that it, it seems that a part of that earlier period survived in the current uh, fast of the Dormition. It begins on August 1st now, and, and, and we begin the season of the cross on August 1st too. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that, that's, so it's the, the, uh, the original three seasons, uh, Great Lent and Holy Week. Remember that for us, Great Lent and Holy Week are two distinct times, two distinct mm -hmm. times. Uh, that Lent ends on the Friday before Palm Sunday, in, in all, not just the Byzantine, but in all the Eastern churches. So Holy Week is its own unique, unique uh, mm -hmm. phenomenon. Mm -hmm. and, so Great Lent and Holy Week, and then the fast before the Nativity and the fast be, uh, between uh, the week after Pentecost and Saints Peter and Paul Day. Those are the three initial seasons. They were in place by the by the fifth century. And then and then what we have now is the Theotokos fast is more toward the Middle Ages. 
and, right. and, and, and then uh, it, it, it seems to be a piece of something else that was popularly observed in many places. Mm -hmm. And then when did the Nativity Fest come in? Oh, it, it's mentioned in the late 4th and, and 5th century. Oh, 4th and okay. And everywhere as 40 days, by the way. Mm -hmm. except, except in the vicinity of Rome. But everywhere else in, in, in Europe, in East and West, whether it's Milan, today is St. Ambrose Day. So uh, in, in the, the Milanese usage, you know, the Ambrosian tradition, in Gaul, in Spain, in England, it was always 40 days. Oh, we have, we have a question. question. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Dan, Dan's question is, uh, he says, glory to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father David. Very good talk. If our Phillips fast is not going so well, what is the first step to get on track to prepare for the nativity? Always when we find that, that you know, we, we fall short in these things, the advice is always the same. Take advantage of the time that remains. And forget about... Forget about your weaknesses and failings of what went on before and take advantage of what there remains. Mm -hmm. So I have a question, for Father David. Uh, so you were, talk, you were speaking about modeling of Christmas and Theophany celebration uh, after resurrection. On Good Friday, Holy Saturday and Pasadena. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that part. But this is more like I haven't found the reference, but... Why is Theophany celebration modeled almost completely after the Christmas celebration? And it's almost also in our customs. So I'm not sure if you know, but on the 5th of January, we're having the very same fasting like on the 24th. And we have the Christmas, well, the second Christmas dinner. That's how we are calling it. And I always th uh, was thinking like why we are doing it. It doesn't really make sense. And I always thought that it is like our, we stubborn uh, Ruthenians, we want to keep the second Christmas because we never really departed from the 6th of January. No, it's not that. It's not that, so why? That. But I never found the reference anywhere. No, the, the, uh, it's a good question, Father. The, the celebration of what is called uh, in, in the Tipicon, you know, they call uh, Christmas a Pascha. Uh, yeah. Pascha, the Pascha of the Lord's Nativity, is it's a unique thing, and this is not just in, again in in our Byzantine tradition, but it also has it, it, a particular form in the Latin and in the other the other Eastern traditions, with the one exception of the Armenians. For the Armenians, there is one united feast that includes. It's, that has its focus both on the, the birth and the baptism of the Lord. In other words, if you go to Armenian church, um, on the, they celebrate this on January 6th. Uh, and you begin on the eve of the feast with, with the nativity of our Lord. And by the time you're done the next morning, you're at the Jordan. So one, one feast for that, because it's the feast, what does the opening mean? Of course, it means the, the manifestation of, of God, the, the appearing of God. So the birth and the baptism are seen as the two particular events that manifest that appearing of God. Now, again, by the, by the fourth century, that united feast has split into two. Yes. Everywhere. Everywhere except in Armenia. So, so, the, so, for example, there is a, a sermon of St. John Chrysostom that he preached on the, on the 20th of December, I forget the year, it's 370-something, in which he told his congregation, this was in Antioch, this is before he went to Constantinople, he said, for the first time, we're going to celebrate the feast that has come from Rome meaning what we call Christmas on December 25th, because that's, the, that's one of the uh, unique contributions of the Roman church to liturgical development. And he says, we're going to celebrate this for the first time, he tells the congregation. And then he says, well, what will we do with our old feast on January 6th? 
we will celebrate that feast as the baptism of the Lord. So the single feast divides into two, but just as you have, of course, a period of fasting before the feast of, of the nativity, well, you don't have another whole season of that before the theophany, but you have one day, theophany Eve, that imitates Christmas Eve. And is it in all the traditions? So, for example, all the Russians are having? All the, I mean, in the Syriac, in the Alexandrian, Topsy, uh, Ethiopians, everybody has it. So it's not our stubbornness. One piece becomes. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. We got a couple, a couple other questions coming in, which is great. Um, Lester uh, submitted the question: Did the Phillips Fest ever have a liturgical rigor similar to the Great to Great Lent? Um, he says, "I find a special." What was that? Um, sorry, there, he says, I, "I find especially here in the Northwest, things can be dreary. At least in Great Lent, we had services to look forward to." <laughs> okay, it's a good question. Now, in terms of in terms of rigor. From what we know about the observance of the other two uh, uh, two fasts, I, I'm not speaking of the Dermitian fast right now, but of the, the Nativity fast or or, or the Philip of Dr. Lepidka, as it's called, uh, named for be, beginning after St. Philip's Day, oh, and the fast uh, after Pentecost or the Apostles' fast, always in all the descriptions of it, the uh, what is prescribed is is less austere than that of Great Lent. Uh, and the other feature of it is you don't have, as you do in Great Lent, you know, this whole uh, Lenten manner of doing the services. So for Monday through Friday, every week during Lent, the services follow the Lenten order. This, of course, uh, has many features to it, but the, one of, of, uh, but the one that we're most familiar with is celebration of the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts which is, of course, to give communion to people who are fasting at the end of the day. That's what it's for. And if we don't remember that, and it just becomes a Lenten service that we like but doesn't have any connection anymore with, with uh, the fasting communion, and it's kind of a you know, uh, question there, <laughs> I would say. But because there's, it's for a reason, that we don't in the Byzantine tradition and in the other Eastern traditions in various ways, that we don't celebrate the divine liturgy on fast days. Mm -hmm. Because fast days are uh, an expression of being on the road, as St. Augustine says, and feast days are an expression of being at home. Mm -hmm. Yet, the Byzantine tradition develops this, this uh, observance during Lent that you... you you have to, you need to have the nourishing of the Holy Eucharist, but you have to have it in connection with fasting and not as a, 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 the way we normally celebrate the, the liturgy festally in the morning, but rather later in the day with a, with a lengthy fast of preparation and then with all of those special features that the liturgy of the pre-sanctified acquired. And it's true that the other fasting seasons do not have that with the only historical exception that I'm aware of is in southern Italy. Hmm. Now, southern Italy, what today would be, you know, Naples and south, Apulia, Calabria, uh, where, where Bari is, where St. Nicholas Relics is, for example. The, the population there, that area, along with Sicily, was known as Magna Grecia for a long time. Greek-speaking population there, Byzantine route. Uh, was not was not of the Latin tradition in southern Italy. So you do find in these old what, what are called Italo-Greek liturgical books a mention of the celebration of the pre-sanctified liturgy during the Nativity fast. Hmm. See, uh, I, I don't think it's done anymore, but it was done for some time. So it did enter into it. Uh, however, uh, our, our questioner asks. Lent is one of the features of Lent is having all these special Lenten services, and we don't seem to have that for this season. And it's on the one hand, it's true that we don't have the services celebrated according to the Lenten order, the special Lenten order. But there are 
all of these days, for example, from the from the beginning of this season, we have we've had the celebration of, of the entry of Our Lady into the temple, and and that that day we say is the herald of the glad tidings of, of the birth of Christ to come, and we begin singing on that feast preparatory hymnography for for the Lord's birth. Then on Saint Andrew's Day, Saint Nicholas Day, uh, and a number of other days. Uh, into the liturgical texts of the days are woven anticipatory hymns for Christmas. Mostly they're borrowed from the service for, from Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we just had St. Nicholas Day. We sang those hymns along with the hymns for St. Nicholas as they're prescribed in the order for the day. Uh, then, and this is, I'm glad this question was asked. We have also a very beautiful thing that's almost entirely neglected in modern times. And that is beginning on December 20th, so for the five days before Christmas, there is a, there is a little Holy Week in which there is, for example, uh, it, when I was a parish priest, I was parish priest for uh, actually 37 years. So I guess my bio said 39, but 37 years. And I always, I always encouraged people and always celebrated uh, in, in, my, in my parishes that I serve, those, the services for those days, they're not, of course, they're not as uh, you know, lengthy as the, service, as the Holy Week services are. But nevertheless, for example, in the evening, there's Vespers with all preparatory hymnography for the Nativity and a special canon, even for every day. And much could be made of those services if people took the, took the energy to do it. Well, and, and don't also, Father David, on a, a liturgical days during the fast, we do do the prayer of St. Ephraim and some pieces from the Triodian. Yes, however, that is true. However, the Tipicon says you may do that. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, that's it's, my... it's not obligatory. It's not oh. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it says it says as the superior desires. <laughs> yeah. so, superior so, desires. Okay. So that's my question, Father David, because uh, I know that this is also discussion uh, about the Nativity Fest in the Orthodox Church, and some people in the Orthodox are of, of some theologians are of opinion that Nativity Fest shouldn't be as rigorous. So, uh, I as I, I was in seminary, we didn't have the days of Alleluia in our celebration during the nativity no, I, I, I'm not, I i did not uh, in my formation i didn't have them either I yes don't, i don't do so that. i'm asking you about your private opinion because you said that for example we should uh, recover our full eucharistic uh, yeah, fasting uh, eucharistic so fast. yeah so nativity fast because i well my, i have my personal opinion uh what it should be uh, but I want to be inspired by yours. Just opinion. You don't... I don't have any opinion about it. <laughs> I would just say that, that you know, the Tipicon, but by the way, the Tipicon, I mean the traditional Tipicon, of course. Not yeah, I know. That's been changed and changed and changed to adapt to modern usages. But in the traditional text of the Tipicon, you know, it says that during the Nativity Fast, there's, there are many days in which we're allowed uh, the usual number of meals and many days on which fish, wine, and oil are allowed. That's not like Great Lent, where, of course, according to, uh, as the Tipicon prescribes on Great Lent, on all the weekdays of Great Lent, we're only to eat once. Yes, so that, but this is the, are the dietary restrictions. And we are, uh, for example, I'm following the dietary restrictions, but in my parish life, I'm not following the days of Alleluia. But but you're not re the days of because I'm not required are an option an option. By the way, for those who might not understand what we're talking about, there are certain days in the Nativity Fast where it says the the superior, the pastor, the abbot, the abbess, whoever the superior is, can can prescribe that the services be celebrated as they would be on a weekday of Great Lent with prostrations and the prayer of Saint Ephraim. Uh, and I have no, I have no objection to doing that if if that's what a community wants to do. I I am not accustomed to it. I, I that's not how you know at, at St. Vladimir Seminary where I was from we didn't do it either. So uh, I the reason why the reason why I've never done it is is simply because I think that those expressions are so tied 
to, to the specific season of Great Lent. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, and they're, you know, they're not, they don't follow any kind of regular pattern. In the, in the no, <laughs> so, they don't. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I'm not, I would ask the question, does this really provide something that's, that's needed? And I, I, I've not been convinced by it. Okay. Thank We've you. got one, one last question here um, from Mark. He was asking, says he's a latecomer <laughs> and uh, to, the, to the talk and new to the Byzantine, right? He says, is Sunday during Philip's fast a day of fasting or also a feast day? Oh, that's a good question. Not only about the, about the uh, nativity fast, but uh, all fasting seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, because, first of all, Sunday is always a feast day but defined by what constitutes a feast day. A feast mm -hmm. day is made a feast day because of the celebration of the divine liturgy. Mm -hmm. okay. That's what mm -hmm. makes a feast day. So in that sense, Sunday is always a feast day. It's never a strict fast day. What do I mean by strict fast day? Well, that's the, the, the archipicon is clear that a strict fast day means that uh, during Lent, there is, there is no celebration of the liturgy. And then there's also the observance of, of what, what should be a total fast throughout the day until you eat your one meal later in the day. That's what a strict fast day is. And you never do that on Sunday. You never do that on Sunday. Uh, however, along with that principle, there is also the principle that if you're going to have a fasting season, some features of that fasting season remain on every day of that season. In other words, the notion that, that uh, there's no kind of observance, uh, no kind of Lenten observance on the Sundays of Lent, uh, that is, would have been unheard of for most of the history of the church. There is a lighter observance. And our our lighter observance in our tradition when we have mitigated days is that firstly you're you're allowed the usual number of meals and secondly you're allowed something it, in, in in lent when it's very strict or the only days on which you're allowed uh wine and cooking with oil are on saturdays and sundays and a couple other days uh on on uh in the other seasons, you're also allowed fish. But the notion that you completely break the seasonal fast on every Sunday, that's completely contrary to the spirit of, of the tradition in the Tipicon. Completely contrary to it. Mm -hmm. it's, and you can see the, that it's even psychologically sound. You know, you begin a season, it's got to be something that carries it through in continuity to the end. Mm -hmm. I, because I have seen this, this modern practice of no, no kind of observance of the fast on Sundays of Lent or Annunciation or something like that, and, and so in which the fast is completely broken on those days. And that was never intended by, by the tradition. And never, never practiced in, in the West either until very recent times, as history goes. And by, by very recent times, I mean, you know, 100, 200 years ago. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that, that's very there's, there's a canon about it, by the way. In the, okay. Yeah, there's a canon about it. In the Council of Trullo, the, the Council of Trullo, whose, whose decisions were, were uh, made part of the, uh, of the corpus of canon law by the Seventh Ecumenical Council. And uh, there's one thing, there's one canon that says, uh, uh, in Armenia, they said, and in some other areas, it has come to our attention that people are, people are eating uh, eggs and cheese and butter on the, week, on the Saturdays and Sundays of Lent. And, we, and we, are, we tell them that they must desist from this, because this is not the practice of the fast that we have received. 